less banker it's very hard to be artistic because you will know that as a banker you need to color within the lines there is no coloring outside of the lines in banking and I'm so glad I've got my own support team Dick I see you over there so please if there's any comments from the from the floor I'm sure you'll deal with that just very quickly because we only have a certain amount of time here um, I've been asked just to talk about my life as a banker and how I would consider or compare that with that of an artist now I come nowhere close to what John has created there, but hopefully, um, you know, my story, and if it will work, okay, so can I, oh, there we go. Okay, hopefully what I'm gonna be able to just cover with you in the time that I have is just to talk about the intrinsic elements um, required by both business as well as art and where to start when using business to make a difference in our nation. And I think we've heard quite a lot about what's happening in our nation today and how we are being touched by decisions of different people. Then just really quickly, where do I come from and where did I start? And basically, how did I manage to go from managing myself and sitting in one chair to managing 25,000 people in ABSA, where I was the retail bank um, executive director at the time? So. This was my blank canvas, and what did I, how, what, what did I do with the art or with my blank canvas? And how I did it, what is in your hand, and what do you paint? How do you paint on your canvas? Right. Just very quickly, in business today, you'll know that when you're starting up a business, I mean, you've got to consider the risks. Many of us as bankers or people from the financial services industry understand risk fully. In fact, sometimes I think we pay too much attention to it and we don't spot the opportunities and go and really explore and do great business because it's all about the risk. Um, it requires personal investment and time to develop yourself and those around you. Also, it's important to note that you've got to understand the big picture. What is it? What is the context of that of your canvas, what is the context? You need courage and authenticity, particularly when you are dealing with people. People can't hear you say one thing and you do another, and you've got to be future-minded. I mean, I think of John right now. If he wasn't future-minded, I can tell you that what's on that canvas now would not have been the result, as great as it is. And we've got to value you know, what enhances humanity and longevity, sustainability in business. Okay. Right, very quickly, how to develop excellence in all aspects of our lives, particularly in your industry, which is profit, strategy, relationship, professional skill, and cultural impact. You've got to consider that when you're in business. Very quickly, my CV, where do I come from? I'm from a place called Mitchell's Plain. Is there anybody out there who knows? I see some heads nodding. So then you'll know that I had a very colorful upbringing. Coming from Mitchell's Plain, I used to always say to people, don't try and scare me. I grew up between the bullets and the blades. So, you know, it's very difficult to scare me. And I think it was a very good position to be in as a banker. Because at the time when I entered banking, of course, there weren't that many women. And by the time I got to managing 25,000 staff and 11 million customers, I was the only woman at the executive at that stage. And to crown it, not just the only woman, but of the 15 executive members of ABSA, there were only three or two of us who were not CAs. I heard about creative accounting just now. You, I, I wasn't one of those because I'm not a CA, okay, just so that we are clear. All right. I've been so blessed in my life to have enjoyed many firsts. I have been the first, I was appointed as the first or elected as the first woman uh, president of the Afrikaanse Handels Institute. Anybody out there knows what that is? Oh, yeah. Okay. And I can tell you the Afrikaans Handels Institute will never be the same again after I was their president. All right. Um, I was the first um, woman vice president of the Agricultural Business Chamber. So I grew up in Mitchell's Plain, but I can tell you a lot about farming. So, you know, don't underestimate just what you see. Right. But having said that, ha and having gone through many firsts in my life, the one thing that if I look back on my life that gives me probably the most, um, the, you know, the warmest feeling of having 
what did I do with all of those fists of having become the executive director of the biggest retail bank in South Africa? Was what did I do with that that I ha had received? How did I touch the lives of the people that had been entrusted to me in terms of the big group of 25,000 people? What did I do to touch the clients, the 11 million clients who were part of the bank at that time? And then what set me apart? What was my unique selling proposition? And then how did I do it? So, I said it before. For me, my unique selling proposition was the ability to touch lives. People really mattered to me, whether it was the client and whether it was the 25,000 staff. So you could say to me, yeah, but you know, managing 25,000 people, how did you manage to touch lives? Well, it was very simple. If you treated those around you, and I had an executive team about, of about 15 people, if you treated them with dignity and respect, you know what happened? That filtered all the way through the business. So that was the one step. The second thing was to introduce things in the business of 25,000 people that made every person in the team feel special. Every person working for me at the time, within, and it wasn't only the 25,000, it was also the rest of the 40,000 staff with, uh, within APSA. Every morning, for the time that I was running the retail bank, when you powered up your laptop, the first thing you'd see on your birthday was a birthday message from me. And if you said, so how did I do it? I didn't sit there through the night. We've got some very clever IT people who could help me with it. Now, that was brilliant because the message there was that I truly cared. But it was very difficult when I'd get into the lift at Towers where I used to be sitting. And people said to me, thank you so much for that message. And I would just pray to God that they weren't expecting me to remember the name. Albeit I tried very hard, tried very hard to remember people's names. But it was about what did I do with that which I was given. It was never just about what I earned. It was never just about the title. It was about genuinely caring about people. I always say, you know, people walk up to you and make you want to know how many degrees you have, right, Dr. Moll? Right? How many degrees? It's more important. In fact, did you, I mean, he didn't introduce himself as Dr. Moll. That was just me throwing something at you there. But it's not important. People think it's important that everybody knows about your degrees and qualifications. Well, there's a very simple view out there that says people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Show them how much you care, and you know what? The rest will be easy. People will support you. They will follow you if they know that you genuinely care for them as individuals. And managing big teams like that can be made easy. If you genuinely walk the talk, people can't be hearing you say that you care and do something totally the opposite. So what I did was, in my travels, in the time that I was looking after this big team, Whenever I used to get into a province, and I used to travel around to the provinces quite often, I didn't only meet with the executive, although I always insisted I didn't want somebody picking me up from the airport that was anybody other than the regional executive themselves, because I needed to be filled in, in terms of what were the goings on, what were the challenges that people were experiencing. And that night, I would have a dinner session with the regional executive and their teams and their spouses. Because guess what? If you really want to get to know somebody, get to know the partners. You will get to know everything, I swear. And I promise you, <laughs> when you are running big teams like that, never get tired of information, because that is what will be your unique selling proposition. It will set you apart from anybody else who's doing the same job. It's about caring. Then. There's something that I introduced when looking after this big team, and I really just want to share this with you. If you ask me about this unique selling proposition, which was about caring for people or touching lives. So I had about 6,000 tellers at the time, and I'll, you know, we were running the bank, and it was quite successful. But because Barclays had just taken on a 52% stake of ABSA at the time, they wanted what was called an uplift in the earnings. So there was about a 30% uplift that was expected from me in the retail bank. Now, I mean, only a mad person will do the same thing and expect a different result, right? So I needed to make magic with the people that I had. I then went, and even though I am not a chartered accountant, I think I am quite good with numbers. I then did my numbers. I went to the executive and I said, look, I want to be able to take my 6,000 tellers and make them top of class in terms of income. 
because at the time, Ned Bank and F&B were ahead of us. And they said to me, there's no way because tellers are commodity skills. Now, for those in business, what's wrong with that statement? That is your customer touch point. That's the first person who touches your customer. How can that be commodity skills? Long story short, I say to them, if you allow me to run what I think I can do to turn this around, I'm going to give you your 30% um, uplift, but I want 30% of that number. And we agreed it because they weren't sure that we could do it. Long story short, we managed to do that within four months. I asked them to give me six months. I increased the, the revenue generated in that business by doing some fancy tweaking and making some commitments to people on the front line. Needless to say, I got the money. I could then increase the salaries to take it to top of class in the country at that time for tellers. But what I could also do, because I had enough money, was to take 100 people on an international cruise for five years running. Now, that may sound like nothing if you're an executive in a business, but for people who'd never come from Freyheit to Johannesburg, then get onto a plane to go to Barcelona, to cruise the Mediterranean and go through all those countries, to do that for 500 people who would not even have seen the outside of their towns was big at the time. And I will tell you, to this day I get messages with people saying to me, if only our executives could understand how to almost maximize our input to turn it into an income generating opportunity to give us more back. And that's something I think that as executives we sometimes miss. How do we utilize our people and what they have in their hand so that we can grow our businesses? And in saying that, I want to say that to, to some of you who are already in businesses, the biggest challenge that you will have is not the numbers that you generate back end but your input into the lives of your people, as well as when you are recruiting, that has to be what takes up the bulk of your time. Stop appointing people only of CVs, because quite frankly, you're going to get the wrong person into the job, and then when you don't get the results back in, guess what? Everybody's going to be disappointed. So I have a saying that says, I get up in the morning, I dress up, I show up, and I speak up. Because you know what? If you're an executive, and even if you're not, if you're striving to be there, if you don't know how to speak up, don't be in that job. Okay. Okay. What do you have in your hand? What is your area of influence? How are you touching lives there where you work and live? And how are you using your influence for the good of others? The example I gave you, when I asked for more money to give people an increase because I wanted to be the best in class on the salary line for my tellers, was to be told that they were commodity skills. What do you have to make decisions about that can impact the lives of those around you? How are you creating your own masterpiece? Because don't forget, I'm giving you a five-minute view of my story and what I did with that which I was given. The question is, where you live and work, what do you do? So what is it that you, what need do you want to address in business? Some of us want to start our businesses or become really good at what we do, but are we clear what is the need that we want to address? Do we know our canvas size? Do we know the borders or the limits of that which it is that we're wanting to, to do in our life? Do we understand, can we just have, just move along there? What do you have in your hand? What skills do you bring to the table? And what resources do you have to make that which you're dreaming of a reality? You know, I, th I think of a verse of scripture where Abram was sitting there after, and I mean, he was late in his years, and he and his wife Sarah were trying to have a baby, and he was praying. He was sitting in a, in a tent, and he was praying and saying, Lord, you know, I don't have a child. I, you know, what's going to, what am I leaving behind? You know, what am I growing? What am I going to leave behind? And the Lord said to him, two things. Step out and then look up. But very often, in the story of our lives, we don't want to follow the instructions, the two steps. Can you imagine if Abram had just looked up in that tent, what would he have seen? Just the tent. He did what God said, which is step out and then look up. He did that and he saw the stars and he was then told, you see the stars in the, in the sky? The generations to follow that will come from you will be more than what you see up there. 
The principle I want to leave with you is, when you want something, follow the steps. There's no jumping up one morning and becoming super successful. Follow the steps. Do good. Touch lives. But Abram had two steps. He had to get up, step out, and look up. In your life, are you prepared to step out and then look up? Or are you going to take the road of least resistance and just look up and don't see it and miss it? I'm so glad in my life I took the steps and I got there. Thank you.